545, chapters 51, 52, and 53, the end of the Tenant of Wildfell Hall. Book talk begins at 17 minutes. Welcome to Craplet, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 545, Spatchcocked. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am tired and apologetic because this week is no different than last week. I just didn't have bandwidth for nearly enough research, but I also didn't want to keep you away from the end of this book any longer. And so here we are. I am going with the it is what it is frame of mind today. So you will get the end of the book and announcement on the next book. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. I <laughs> I want to do something funner. I want to do something lighter. I want to do something maybe murder mystery, maybe kind of social comedy thing. I'm not sure. Obviously, it's all going to be public domain, so it's all going to be old, which is just fine. It may be American. I am not sure. But we will all find out in January. <laughs> I will find out with you. And then we will enjoy ourselves. But it will definitely be lighter than Tenet of Wildfell Hall. Just like swinging from the Count of Monte Cristo into Anne of Green Gables seemed like a good idea. I think we need to, to swing to something lighter now. The world of case investigation and contact tracing remains dense with work right now. So please <laughs> lighten my load by wearing a mask. I don't remember if I mentioned this before. Case investigation and contact tracing has been going on for a really long time. We just didn't really notice it unless we got an infectious disease, a really infectious disease, and got called by someone. So, you know, if you hear somebody saying something about this all being some new conspiracy, nah, nah, it's an old conspiracy. <laughs> no, people in public health have been trying to stop people from getting sick for a really long time. It's funny that way. So when people answer their phones, it works very well. And the people who are calling are providing help and services and information to help you stay safe. And if you need access to a service in your area, doing our best to hook you up with what you need. So that's not unique to Pennsylvania. That's just what's happening. There's just a lot of it happening. On the flip side, there's lots of bookmark making and knitting and crocheting and sewing and all sorts of cool stuff. I got a gorgeous bookmark in the mail from listener Ann Blanton. Ann, I think, is not on Instagram, but if you are, I will be posting, posting a picture of the sucker so that you can see the gorgeousness that is this bookmark. It's all colors like Arizona, and it makes me very happy to look at. And it is currently holding my place in the Tenant of Wildfell Hall, where prior to this I'd been using big old honkin' binder clips. So this is much more attractive now. Thank you, Anne. Ooh, and I also have a voicemail, and this one is important. Here we go. Hi, Heather. This is Deb Hall. I am a long-term listener. I'm listening to episode 539, and I just wanted to give you a little correction on some of your medical information you were discussing. Um, I do appreciate all the work you're doing as a contact tracer, as a family physician. Uh, I am seeing, obviously, a big increase in COVID cases, and I'm the person outside swabbing noses in a tent in the cold and would prefer to have to do less of this. Anyway, as far as viruses go, chickenpox can actually be a really terrible disease to get as a kid, even though most people who get it or got it only have an itchy rash. You can have 
chickenpox encephalitis or pneumonia, that means either a brain or lung infection. I have seen kids with necrotizing fasciitis, which is the flesh-eating bacteria, as a secondary complication to chickenpox. So it's not a benign disease. And those who don't vaccinate their children do certainly run serious risk of their kids having even a life-ending event by not having a vac uh, vaccine for a disease that we can prevent. Of course, shingles, they won't get later on if they've been vaccinated. As far as when you mentioned um, it being a risk for sterility, you're confusing that with mumps. That's the disease that if men get, they can get an orchitis, a testicular infection that causes sterility. Anyway, I appreciate all your work. I love the book. And again, thanks for the contact tracing. Bye-bye. So, thank you for the correction. So glad to know it's mumps. That, that will actually make me live a little easier. And holy cow, I had no idea about the horrible. Now I understand why chickenpox has a vaccine. So thank you, Deb. That was hugely helpful for the redirect. Oh, and going back to Christmas and presents and things like that, Listener Laura shared early Tuesday morning a really fabulous company. I have not personally tested their items yet, but I will very soon. She, I trust, she has used these products. And I, I just have to tell you, if you're familiar with OP, the OPI nail polish, you are probably familiar also with the fact that they have the best names for their nail polish, like the kind of burgundy red called I'm Not Really a Waitress, happens to be my favorite polish. There is an ink company in the States with the same kind of thinking about naming things. So for example, we have Bulletproof Blue Ghost Invisible Fountain Pen Ink. That's right, you heard it here first, or second, because if you're Laura, you definitely didn't hear it here first. But Bulletproof Blue Ghost Invisible Fountain Pen Ink. They sell really reasonably priced fountain pens. If you read the reviews, they say the pens themselves are a little bit fiddly. Uh, you have to kind of work with them because they have very flexible nibs, which makes it very easy to do things like calligraphy, fancy schmancy writing, things like that. However, while their pens seem just fine, nifty even, the ink, the ink names are what I'm staying for because they have a red called Rome Burning. They have a really brilliant fuchsia color and it is dead on accurate for its name, which is saguaro wine. It is the color of saguaro blossoms in the spring in Arizona. They have a green eternal, a dragon's napalm. <laughs> they do have just a regular red they have a Tiananmen red, which is gorgeous. Black swan in English roses. Blue-nosed bear, which is blue. White of the whale, which is not a true white. It's uh, exactly white that you would expect with a name like that. Dark matter, heart of darkness. <laughs> Habanero, which is a really dark green. It just goes on and on. If you do nothing else, look up noodlers, N-O-O-D-L-E-R-S, and just re read the names of their ink. It will just make you happy and it will make you giggle. And another thing that will make you happy is a book, not just any book. It's a book called Humankind. This book is changing Thing One, Aaron's life for the better and all of the rest of us as well. My sister read it. My sister has handed it off to absolutely everybody she knows. I have been sending it to people I know. It is spectacular. It will confirm all the things that you thought you knew, but people kept telling you were, you were wrong about, about human nature and how we're really not so Hobbesian. We're really not so bad. But one of the things that happens is every time there's a, a study that's done that appears to have any inkling of bad behavior on the part of humankind, that sells papers. And so we tend to hear about the bad 
people research in a much greater amount than we hear about the good people research, of which there's tons. So the book is not Pollyanna-ish. The book is actually really well balanced and, and talks about the things that we haven't quite mastered on the good scale of things to do. But it also spends ample time telling us about our misconceptions because of misrepresentations of the facts. So, Humankind, all one word, A Hopeful History by Rutger Bregman. It's uh, translated, I believe, from the Dutch. You may have seen him on clips on places like YouTube and, and the news because he's the guy who in Davos several years ago said, when he was asked a question about world economic stuff, he said, well, the elephant in the room really is the extraordinarily rich people need to start paying their share of the burden. I mean, right? I mean, that's the thing that nobody's talking about that's all kind of obvious to all of us, right? And he immediately became the least popular person in Davos that year at the World Economic Summit. So he's got an interesting track record out there. He is both funny and light and positive. So that has been a good thing, along with noodlers. Another good thing, spatchcocking a bird. Wow, I didn't know this was a thing. I didn't know it was a thing you could do. I didn't know it was a thing you could get a butcher to do. I didn't know you could get a turkey this way. We had a 15-pound turkey because mama requires soup after Thanksgiving. We had a 15-pound turkey cook in a little bit under two hours. Golden, shiny, basted it with Southern Comfort so it was sweet. I think I shared a picture of it to Instagram. I'm not sure. I'll check. If I didn't, I will. Stunning. Really, really good. Really fast cooking. Nobody has to get up early to cook this bird. So we had a, a lovely Thanksgiving in the Ordover household. I hope those of you who celebrate that particular holiday also had a wonderful and safe time. I also hope you enjoy saying the word spatchcock as much as I do. Another wonderful and happy and safe by then time we are going to have together, many of us, is going to Ireland. I have some news from Diane. We are actually full. Part of the reason we are full so soon is because we have smaller numbers. However, vaccines now being on the horizon and perhaps people, you know, finding masks in the wintertime to be more tolerable there is every possibility that we are going to wind up with more seats opening up on the tour. So please, 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 if you are interested, wait list. We have a wait list. That means that you can still call 888-554-5208. Get your name on the wait list because life is all about hope, right? And humankind will tell you we are better than we think right now. And therefore, I'm looking forward to seeing more of you on the trip. So again, 888-554-5208. Get your name on the wait list. And as Diane, who knows all things about this tour business, says to me, we have a long time before the final payment is due on June 29th. So the chances of being confirmed, even off the wait list, are really quite good. And one of the places we're going to go to in Ireland is Giant's Causeway, which I am sure is one of those places that people, like in New York City, it's like there's the Statue of Liberty. And if you live in New York City, you see it all the time, you know it's there. You may or may not have gone there. Maybe you went during, when you were in school, but mm, I have a feeling Giant's Causeway is kind of like that in Ireland because it's just normal if you live near there, near Derry. If you're not from there and you don't live anywhere near Death Valley, you or Devil's Tower. You may never have seen anything like this before. Giant's Causeway is also special because unlike Death Valley and unlike Devil's Tower, Giant's Causeway is touching the ocean. So seeing this kind of geological formation close to water is really cool looking. If you've seen the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, if you don't live anywhere near Death Valley in California or Devil's Tower, Montana, if you've seen the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 
the last kind of iconic section of the film takes place at Devil's Tower in Montana, which really is quite far off the beaten path. And it's smaller than one might think if you've seen the movie. I got to go there when I was a kid with my family when we were, I think, heading towards Sioux Falls, South Dakota to live there for the summer. I think it was going that direction. I don't think it was coming home. I think it was going there. Either way, when I drove from Tucson to Virginia with the boys, uh, you may recall Devil's Tower was one of the places I stopped them. Both times I was struck by how small the place actually is. But then you hike up a bit and you get up by the rocks. These are geometrically made by God, very long, tall, thin basalt columns, the geology of which is really fascinating. And I'm already yammering too much, so I don't want to spend too much more time telling you about any of that. But wow, they're huge. They're, they're more than human sized across some of them. Some of them are human sized across. Some of them are smaller than human sized across. They're amazing. And they are, it's like, it's like a Play-Doh extruder decided to build a mountain. And in this case, a walkway, because these basalt columns, some of them have been kind of worn down by time. And so you walk across, it's like walking across the top of Devil's Tower. It's just so cool. I am so looking forward to this. So that's all I wanted to say about our next day in Ireland. Ah, I just can't wait. And Aiden is so jonesing for this right now. It's awesome. Of course, he's also really excited to get to see friends someday again, too. But, but that's beside the point. Ireland is really even much better than that, even he would admit. So that's exciting stuff. So is the end of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. Not as exciting as like The Woman in White. I'm out there in front of it letting you know, not that exciting. But nonetheless, it's exciting because we get to see what is actually kind of close to a less Jane Eyre, Rochester, Romance, capital R, end to a story, and more a small, quiet, real end to a story, which I give Anne a lot of credit for, because on one side, she's got Jane in Rochester, and on the other side, she's got Kathy in Heathcliff, and she's holding her ground. And perhaps this is a small, quiet ending specifically because she was surrounded by big, crazy, loud romance <laughs> in her two sisters writing. And so she just had to be a counterpoint. It wouldn't surprise me a bit. I also did read there was somebody in her life who she seemed to have been very fond of and who was, in fact, very fond of her as well. In 1839, a man named William Waitman, W-E-I-G, H T M A N came to be curate in Haworth and and work with Patrick Bronte. And there's some writing in a, a letter, I think, to Ellen Nussy from Charlotte talking about watching him in church in the morning watch Anne, that he just couldn't take his eyes off her. And she's she's so quiet and so serious about her religion, she never seemed to notice at least as far as, as what Charlotte said. This is during the time that Anne is going back and forth between Haworth and being a, a governess, and it wasn't the easiest time for her. It also wasn't the, the worst time for her because she did finally kind of vindicate herself with that family that she'd had so much trouble with and that Branwell had so, so much trouble with. She actually did finally get the kids to come around. And if you look for it, any art, watercolors, or sketches on the internet for Anne Bronte, there is a watercolor that she did of, I think it was the youngest girl in the family, that is really quite lovely. And, and she was good. It's too bad that so little of what she did survived. But that, that particular watercolor of, of the little girl is still owned by the family. So nice little treasured heirloom there. So William Waitman comes, he's curate, he's known to the family, he is safe, he likes Anne, 
And evidently she liked him enough because just a few years later, in 1842, in September, he was 28 years old and died of cholera because this family just cannot catch a break. So guys were not unknown to Anne. I mean, obviously, she'd been living among other families for a while by the time she wrote this book. And I think she knew what it was to be liked by someone fondly. And that, I think, also speaks volumes to the way this book ends. There is not much that you need from me, especially since it's the the ending chapters, kind of all the learning we had to do already got done. One thing to let you know, and I do try and reiterate this anytime we come across it when we are in a new book, it's been a while since we've talked about it, modes of transportation. When you hear gig, G-I-G, that is a lightweight two-wheeled vehicle, and a fly would be an even smaller vehicle that would be uh, hired. It's, um, it's a one-horse carriage. And then a car, C-A-R, because there were cars, were two-wheeled carts, which meant not going to go particularly fast, not, not built for speed. <laughs> at all. So, gig, two-wheeled, lightweight, fast, fly, smaller, one-horse, fast, cart, plodding, but at least something that can be attached to a horse and move along. You will also hear the word clodhopper. It is exactly what it sounds like. It's a pejorative term. It is used to describe mostly farm people who have dirt clods around them. I looked this up in the OED that I got used off of Amazon, what, two, three years ago? I looked up clodhopper. The first usage of this term was 1579 in England. So there were lots of different variations on this, by the way. Lots of ways to insult people using the word clod, C-L-O-D. So that, (laughs) the OED paid off. And and literally, that is it. That's everything you need from me before we start. So let's start. Here we go with the final chapters, 51, 52, and 53, of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte, read for us by Eden Ballantyne. Here we go. Chapter 51. An Unexpected Occurrence. We will now turn to a certain still, cold, cloudy afternoon, about the commencement of December, when the first fall of snow lay thinly scattered about the blighted fields and frozen roads, or stored more thickly in the hollows of the deep cart ruts and footsteps of men and horses, impressed in the now petrified mire of the last month's drenching rains. I remember it well for I was walking home from the vicarage with no less remarkable personage than Miss Eliza Millward by my side. I had to call upon her father, a sacrifice to civility undertaken entirely to please my mother, not myself, for I hated to go near the house, not merely on account of my antipathy to the once so bewitching Eliza, but because I had not half forgiven the old gentleman himself for his ill opinion of Mrs Huntingdon. For now, though, constrained to acknowledge himself mistaken in my former judgment, he still maintained that she had done wrong to leave her husband. It was a violation of her sacred duties as a wife, and a temptation of providence by laying herself open to temptation, and nothing short of a bodily ill-usage and that of no trifling nature could excuse such a step. Not even that, for in such a case she ought to appeal to laws for protection. But it was not of him I intended to speak, it was of his daughter Eliza. Just as I was taking leave of the vicar, She entered the room, ready equipped for a walk. "'I was just coming to see your sister, Mr Markham,' said she. "'And so, if you have no objection, I'll accompany you home. "'I like company when I'm walking out, don't you?' "'Yes, it's very agreeable.' "'That, of course,' rejoined the young lady, smiling archly. "'So we proceeded together. "'Shall I find Rose at home, do you think?' said she as we closed the garden gate and set our faces towards Linden Carr. I believe so. I trust I shall, for I have a little bit of news for her, 
if you haven't forestalled me. I? Yes. Do you know what Mr Lawrence has gone for? She looked up anxiously for my reply. Is he gone? said I, and her face brightened. Ah, then he hasn't told you about his sister. What of her? I demanded in terror, lest some evil should have befallen her. Oh, Mr Markham, how you blush! cried she with a tormenting laugh. <laughs> You've not forgotten her yet, but you had better be quick about it, I can tell you, for alas, alas, she's going to be married next Thursday. No, Miss Eliza, that's false. Do you charge me with falsehood, sir? You aren't misinformed, am I? Do you know better, then? I think so. What makes you so pale, then? said she, smiling with a delight at my emotions. Is it anger at poor me for telling such a fib? Well, I only tell the tale as twas told to me. I don't vouch for the truth of it, but at the same time, I don't see what reason Sarah should have for deceiving me, or her informant for deceiving her. And that was what she told me the footman told her, that Mrs Huntingdon was going to be married on Thursday, and Mr Lawrence was going to the wedding. She did tell me the name of the gentleman, but I've forgotten that. Perhaps you can assist me to remember it. Is there not someone that lives near, or frequently visits the neighbourhood, that has been long attached to her. Uh, Mr... Oh dear, Mr... Hargrave, suggested I with a bitter smile. You're right, she cried. That's the very name. Impossible, Miss Eliza, I exclaimed in a tone that made her start. Well, you know, that's what they told me, said she, composedly staring me in the face. And then she broke out in a long, shrill laugh that put me at my wit's end with fury. Really, you must excuse me, cried she. I know it's very rude, but <laughs> did you think to marry you yourself? Dear, dear, what a pity. <laughs> Gracious, Mr Markham, are you going to faint? Oh, mercy. Shall I call this man? Here, Jacob. But checking the words on her lips, I seized her arm and gave it, I think, a pretty severe squeeze for she shrank into herself with a faint cry of pain or terror, but the spirit within her was not subdued. Instantly rallying, she continued with a well-feigned concern. What can I do for you? Will you have some water, some brandy? I dare say they have some in the public house down there, if you let me run. I've done with this nonsense, cried I sternly. She looked confounded, almost frightened again for a moment. You know I hate such jests. I continued. Jess, indeed, I wasn't jesting. You were laughing at all events, and I don't like to be laughed at, returned I, making violent efforts to speak with proper dignity and composure, and to say nothing but what was coherent and sensible. And since you're in such a merry mood, Miss Eliza, you must be good enough company for yourself, and therefore I shall leave you to finish your walk alone. For now I think of it, I have business elsewhere, so good evening. And with that I left her, smothering her malicious laugh, and turning aside into the fields, springing up the bank and pushing through the nearest gap in the hedge, determined at once to prove the truth, or rather the falsehood of her story, I hastened to Woodford as fast as my legs would carry me, first veering round by a circuitous course, but the moment I was out of sight of my fair tormentor cutting away across the country, just as a bird might fly, over pasturelands and fallow and stubble and lane, clearing hedges and ditches and hurdles, till I came to the young squire's gate. Never till now had I known the full fervour of my love, the full strength of my hopes, not wholly crushed even at my hours of deepest despondency, always tensiously clinging to the thought that one day she might be mine, or if not that, at least that something of my memory, some slight remembrance of our friendship and our love, would be forever cherished in her heart. I marched up to the door, determined if I saw the master to question him boldly concerning his sister, to wait and hesitate no longer, but cast false delicacy and stupid pride behind my back, and know my fate at once. Is Mr Lawrence at home? I eagerly asked of the servant that opened the door. No, sir. Master went away yesterday, replied he, looking very alert. Went where? To Grassdale, sir. W weren't you aware, sir? He's very close, his master said the fellow with a foolish simpering grin. 
I suppose, sir. But I turned and left him, without waiting to hear what he supposed. I was not going to stand there to expose my tortured feelings to an insolent laughter and impertinent curiosity of a fellow like that. But what was to be done now? Could it be possible she had left me for that man? I could not believe it. Me she might forsake, but not to give herself to him. Well, I would know the truth. To no concerns of daily life could I attend while this tempest of doubt and dread, of jealousy and rage, distracted me. I would take the morning coach from Leeds. The evening one would be already gone, and fly to Grassdale. I must be there before the marriage. And why? Because a thought struck me that perhaps I might prevent it. That if I did not, she and I might both lament it to the latest moments of our lives. It struck me that someone might have belied me to her. Perhaps her brother, yes. No doubt her brother had persuaded her that I was false and faithless and taken advantage of her natural indignation, and perhaps her despondency, carelessness about future life had urged her, artfully, cruelly, onto this other marriage in order to secure her from me. If this was the case, and if she should only discover her mistake when it was too late to repair it, to what a life of misery and vain regret might she be doomed as well as me, and what remorse for me to think my foolish scruples had induced it all. Oh, I must see her. She must know my truth, even if I told her at the church door. I might pass for a madman or an impertinent fool. She might be offended at such an interruption, or at least might tell me it was now too late. But if I could save her, if she might be mine. It was too rapturous a thought. Winged by this hope, and goaded by these fears, I hurried homeward to prepare for my departure on the morrow. I told my mother that urgent business which admitted no delay but which I could not then explain called me away. My deep anxiety and serious preoccupation could not be concealed from her maternal eyes, and I had much ado to calm her apprehensions of some disastrous mystery. That night there came a heavy fall of snow, which so retarded the progress of the coach on the following day that I was almost driven to distraction. I travelled all night, of course, for this was Wednesday. Tomorrow morning, doubtless the marriage would take place, but the night was long and dark. The snow heavily clogged the wheels and balled the horses' feet. The animals were consumedly lazy. The coachman most exorably cautious. The passengers confoundedly apathetic in their supine indifference to the rate of our progress. Instead of assisting me to bully the several coachmen and urge them forward, they merely stared and grinned at my impatience. One fellow even ventured to rally me upon it, but I silenced him with a look that quelled him for the rest of the journey. And when at the last stage I would have taken the reins into my own hand, they all with one accord opposed it. It was broad daylight when we entered Mansfield, and drew up at the Rose and Crown. I alighted and called aloud for a poor chaise to Grassdale. There was none to be had. The only one in the town was under repair. A gig then, a fly, a car, anything, only be quick! There was a gig, but not a horse to spare. I sent into town to seek one but there was such an intolerable time about it that I could wait no longer. I thought my own feet could carry me sooner, and bidding them send a conveyance after me, if they were ready within an hour, I set off as fat as I could walk. The distance was little more than six miles, but the road was strange, and I had to keep stopping to inquire my way, hallowing to carters and clodhoppers, and frequently invading the cottages where there were few abroad that winter's morning, sometimes knocking up the lazy people from the beds, and where so little work was to be done, perhaps so little food and fire to be had. They cared not to contain their slumbers. I had no time to think of them. However aching with weariness and desperation, I hurried on. The gig did not overtake me, and it was well I had not waited for it. Vexations, rather, that I had been fool enough to wait so long. At length, however, I entered the neighbourhood of Grassdale. I approached the little rural church, but lo, there stood a train of carriages before it. It needed not the white favours bedecking the servants and horses, nor the merry voices of the village idlers assembling to witness the show, to appraise me that there was a wedding within. I ran in among them, demanding with breathless eagerness, had the ceremony long commenced, the only gaped and stared. In my desperation I pushed past them, and was about to enter the churchyard gate, when a group of ragged urchins that had been hanging like bees to the window suddenly dropped off and made a rush for the porch, vociferating in the uncouth dialect of their country, something which signified, It's over! They're coming out! 
if Eliza Millwood had seen me then, she might have indeed been delighted. I grasped the gatepost for support, and stood intently gazing towards the door to take my last look at my soul's delight. My first on that detested mortal, who had torn her from my heart, and doomed her, I was certain, to a life of misery and hollow vain repining. For what happiness could she enjoy with him? I did not wish to shock her with my presence now, but I had not the power to move away. Forth came the bride and the bridegroom. Him I saw not. I had eyes for none but her. A long veil shrouded half her graceful form, but did not hide it. I could see that while she carried her head erect, her eyes were bent upon the ground, and her face and neck were suffused with a crimson blush. But every feature was radiating with smiles, and gleaming through the misty whiteness of her veil were clusters of golden ringlets. Oh, heavens! It was not my Helen! The first glimpse of her made me start, but my eyes were darkened with exhaustion and despair. Dare I trust them? Yes, it is not she. It was a younger, slightly rosier beauty, lovely indeed, but with far less dignity and depth of soul, without that indefinable grace, that keenly spirited yet gentle charm, that ineffable power to attract and subjugate the heart. My heart at least. I looked at the bridegroom, it was Frederick Lawrence. I wiped away the cold sweat that were trickling down my forehead and stepped back as he approached. But his eyes fell upon me and he knew me, altered as my appearance must have been. Is that you, Markham? said he, startled and confounded by the apparition. Perhaps, too, at the wildness of my looks. Yes, Lawrence, is that you? I mustered the presence of my mind to reply. He smiled and coloured, as if half proud and half ashamed of his identity, as if he had reason to be proud of the sweet lady on his arm. He had no less cause to be ashamed of having concealed his good fortune so long. Allow me to introduce my bride, said he, endeavouring to hide his embarrassment by an assumption of careless gaiety. Esther, this is Mr Markham, my friend Markham, Mrs Lawrence, late Miss Hargrave. I bowed to the bride and vehemently wrung the bridegroom's hand. "'Why did you not tell me of this?' said I, reproachfully pretending a resentment I did not feel. For in truth I was almost wild with joy to find myself so happily mistaken and overflowing with affection to him for this, and for the base injustice I had felt I had done him in my mind. He might have wrung me, but not to the extent. And as I had hated him like a demon for the last forty hours... The reaction from such a feeling was so great that I could pardon all offences for that moment, and I loved him in spite of them too. I did tell you, said he, with an air of guilty confusion. You received my letter. What letter? The one announcing my intended marriage. I never received the most distant hint of such intentions. It must have crossed you on the way then. It should have received you yesterday morning. It was rather late, I acknowledge. But what brought you here, then, if you received no information? It was now my turn to be confounded. But the young lady, who had been busily patting the snow with her foot during our short sotto voice colloquy, very opportunely came to my assistance by pinching her companion's arms and whispering a suggestion that his friend should be invited to step into the carriage and go with him, it being scarcely agreeable to stand there among so many gazers and keep their friends waiting into the bargain. And so cold it is too, said he, glancing with dismay at her slight drapery, and immediately handing her into the carriage. Markham, you will come? We are going to Paris, but we can drop you anywhere between this and Dover. No, a thank you, a, a goodbye. I needn't wish you a pleasant journey, but I shall expect a very handsome apology sometime, mind, and a score of letters before we meet again. He shook my hand, and hastened to take his place beside his lady. This was no time or place for explanation or discourse. We had already stood long enough to excite the wonder of the village sightseers, and perhaps the wrath of the intendant bridal party, though, of course, all this passed in much shorter time than I have taken to relate, or even that you will take to read it. I stood beside the carriage, and the window being down, I saw my happy friend fondly encircling his companion's waist with his arm, while she rested her glowing cheek on his shoulder, 
looking the very impersonation of loving, trusting bliss. In the interval between the footman closing the door and taking his place behind, she raised her smiling brown eyes to his face, observing playfully, I fear you must think me very insensible, Frederick. I know it is the custom for ladies to cry on these occasions, but I couldn't squeeze a tear for my life. He only answered with a kiss and pressed her still closer to his bosom. But what is this? he murmured. Why, Esther, you're crying now. Oh, it's nothing. It's only too much happiness and the wish, sobbed she, that our dear Helen was as happy as ourselves. Bless you for that wish, I inwardly responded as the carriage rolled away. And heaven grant it be not wholly vain. I thought a cloud had suddenly darkened her husband's face as she spoke. What did he think? Could he grudge such happiness to his dear sister and his friend as he now felt himself? At such a moment it was impossible. The contrast between her fate and his must darken his bliss for a time. Perhaps too we thought of me. Perhaps he regretted the part he had in preventing our union by omitting to help us if not by actually plotting against us. I exonerated him from that charge now, and deeply lamented my former ungenerous suspicions, but he had wronged us still. I hoped, I trusted he had, he had not attempted to cheek the course of our love by actually damming up the stream in their passages, but he had passively watched the two currents wandering through life's arid wilderness, declining to clear away the obstructions that divided them, and secretly hoping that both would lose themselves in the sand, before they could be joined in one. And meantime, he had been quietly proceeding with his own affairs. Perhaps his heart and head had been so full of his fair lady that he had but little thought to spare for others. Doubtless, he had made his first acquaintance with her, his first intimate acquaintance at least, during his three months sojourn at Filey, for I now recollected that he had once casually let it fall an intimation that his aunt and sister had a young friend staying with him at the time and this accounted for at least one half of his silence about all transactions there. Now too I saw the reason for so many little things that had slightly puzzled me before, among the rest, for sundry departures from Woodford, and absences more or less prolonged, for which he never satisfactorily accounted, and concerning which he hated to be questioned on his return. Well might the servants say his master was very close, but why the strange reserve to me? partly from that remarkable idiosyncrasy to which I have before alluded, partly perhaps from tenderness to my feelings, or fear to disturb my philosophy by touching upon the infectious theme of love. Chapter 52 Fluctuations The tardy gig had overtaken me at last. I entered it, and bade the man who brought it to drive to Grassdale Manor. I was too busy with my own thoughts to care to drive it myself. I would see Mrs. Huntingdon. There could be no impropriety in that now that her husband had been dead above a year, and by her indifference or her joy at my unexpected arrival, I would soon tell whether her heart was truly mine. But my companion, a loquacious forward fellow, was not disposed to leave me to the indulgence of my private cogitations. There they go, said he, as the carriages filed away before us. There'll be brave doings on yonder today as what comes tomorrow. Know anything in that family, sir, or you stranger in these parts? I know them by report. Hm, that's the best of them gone anyhow. Or I suppose the old missus is going to leave after this stir's gotten over and take herself off somewhere to live in a bit of a jointure. And the young un, at least, the new un, she's none very young, is coming down to live at Grove. Is Mr. Hargrave married, then? Oi, sir, a few months since. He should have been wed afore to a widow lady, but they couldn't agree over the money. She'd a rare long purse, and Mr. Hargrave wanted it all to herself, but she wouldn't let it go, so they fell out. This one ain't quite as rich, nor as handsome either, but she has been married before. She's very plain, they say, and getting on to fort your past. And so, you know, if she didn't jump at this opportunity, she thought she never would get a better. I guess she thought such a handsome young husband was worth all that she ever had, and she might take it and welcome. But I lay she'll rue her bargain or for long. 
they say she begins already to see that he isn't not altogether that nice, generous, pearl delightful gentleman that she thought him afore marriage. He begins of being careless and masterful already. Oi, she'll find him harder and carelesser nor she thinks on. You seem well acquainted with him, I observed. I am, sir. I've known him since he was quite a young gentleman, and proud and he was, and a willful. I was servant yonder for several years, but I couldn't stand their niggardly ways. She got ever longer and worse, did missus, with her nipping and screwing and watching and grudging, so I thought I'd find another place. Are we not near the house? said I, interrupting him. Yes, sir, yon's the park. My heart sank within me to behold the stately mansion in the midst of its expansive grounds. The park as beautiful now in its wintry garb as it could be in its summer glory. The majestic sweep, the undulating swell and fall, displaying to full advantage in the robe of dazzling purity, stainless and printless, save one long winding track left by the trooping deer. The stately timber trees, with their heavy laden branches gleaming white against the dull grey sky, and deep encircling woods, the broad expanse of water sleeping in frozen quiet, and the weeping ash and willows drooping their snow-clad boughs above it, all presented a picture, striking indeed, and pleasing to an encumbered mind, but by no means encouraging to me. There was one comfort, however. All this was entailed upon little Arthur, and could not under any circumstances, strictly speaking, be his mother's. But how was she situated? Overcome with a sudden effort, my repugnance to mention her name to my glorious companion, I asked him if he knew whether her late husband had left a will, and how the property had been disposed of. Oh yes, he knew all about it, and I was quickly informed that to her had been left the full control and management of the estate during her son's minority, besides the absolute unconditional possession of her own fortune, but I knew that her father had not given her much and the small additional sum that had been settled upon before a marriage. Before the close of the explanation, he drew up at the park gates. Now for the trial. If she should find her within, but alas, she might still be at Stanningley. Her brother had given no intimation to the country, and inquired at the porter's lodge if Mrs. Huntingdon were at home. No, she was with her aunt in Derbyshire, but was expected to return before Christmas. She usually spent all the time at Stanningley, only coming to Grassdale occasionally, when the management of affairs or the interest of her tenants and dependents required her presence. Near what town is Stanningley situated? I asked. The requisite information was soon obtained. Now then, my man, give me the reins, and we'll return to Mansfield. I must have some breakfast at the Rose and Crown, and then away to Stanningley by the first coach for Derby. At Mansfield, I had time before the coach started to replenish my forces with a hearty breakfast and to obtain the refreshments of my usual morning's ablutions and the ameliorations of some slight change in my toilet, and also to dispatch a short note to my mother, excellent son that I was, to assure her that I was still in existence and to excuse my non-appearance at the expected time. It was a long journey to Stanningley, for those slow travelling days, but I did not deny myself some needed refreshments on the road, nor even a night's rest in a wayside inn, choosing rather to brook a little delay than to present myself worn, wild and weather-beaten before my mistress and her aunt, who would be astonished enough to see me without that. Next morning, therefore, I not only fortified myself with the substantial breakfast as my excited feelings would allow me to swallow, but I bestowed a little more than usual time and care upon my toilet, and furnished with a change of linen from my small carpet-bag, well-brushed clothes, well-polished boots, and neat new gloves. I mounted the lightning and resumed my journey. I had nearly two stages yet before me, but the coach, I was informed, passed through the neighbourhood of Stanningley, and having desired to be set down as near the hall as possible, I had nothing to do but to sit with folded arms and speculate upon the coming hour. It was a clear, frosty morning. The very fact of sitting exalted aloft, surveying the snowy landscape and sweet sunny sky, inhaling the pure, bracing air and crunching away over the crisp, frozen snow, was exhilarating enough in itself. 
but add to this, the idea of to what goal I was hastening, and whom I was expected to meet, and you may have some faint concept of my frame of mind. Only a faint one, though, for my heart swelled with unspeakable delight, and my spirits rose almost to madness, in spite of my prudent endeavour to bind them down to a reasonable platitude by thinking of the undeniable difference between Helen's rank and mine, of all she had passed through since our parting, of a long and broken silence, and above all of a cool, cautious aunt, whose counsel she would doubtless be careful not to slight again. These considerations made my heart flutter with anxiety, and my chest heave with impatience to get the crisis over, but they could not dim her image from my mind, or mar the vivid recollection of what had been said and felt between us, or destroy the keen anticipation of what was to be. In fact, I could not realise their terrors now. Towards the end of the journey, however, a couple of my fellow passengers kindly came to my assistance and brought me low enough. Fine land this, said one of them, pointing with his umbrella to the wide fields on the right, conspicuous for their compact hedgerows, deep well-cut ditches and fine timber trees growing sometimes on the border, sometimes in the midst of their enclosure. Very fine land if you saw it in the summer or spring. Aye, responded the other, a gruff elderly man with a drab greatcoat buttoned up to the chin and a cotton umbrella between his knees. It's all Maxwell's, I suppose. It was, sir, but he's dead now. You're aware? And has left it all to his niece. All? Every rod of it. And the mansion house and all. Every hatton of his worldly goods, except just a trifle by way of remembrance to his nephew down in Shropshire, and an annuity to his wife. It's strange, sir. It is, sir. And she wasn't his own niece, neither. But he'd no near relations of his own, none but a nephew he'd quarrelled with. And he always had a partiality for this one. And then his wife advised him to it, they say. As she'd brought both to the property, and it was her wish that this lady should have it. Hm! She'll be a fine catch for somebody. She will, so. She's a widow, but quite young yet, and uncommonly handsome. A fortune of her own besides, and only one child and she's nursing a fine estate for him in Derbyshire. There'll be lots to speak for her. Afraid there's no chance for us. <laughs> Facetiously jogging me with his elbow as well as his companion. <laughs> no offence, sir, I hope. To me. <laughs> I think she'll marry none but a nobleman myself. Look you, sir, resumed he, turning to his other neighbour and pointing past me with his umbrella. That's the hall, Grand Park, you see, and all them woods. Plenty of timber there, and lots of game. Hello, what now? This exclamation was occasioned by the sudden stoppage of the coach at the park gates. Gentlemen for standing the yawl, cried the coachman, and I rose and threw my carpet back to the ground, preparatory to dropping myself down after it. A sickly, sir, asked my talkative neighbour staring me in the face. I dare say I was white enough. No, here, coachman. Thank you, sir. All right. The coachman pocketed his fee and drove away, leaving me not walking up the park, but pacing to and fro before its gates with folded arms and eyes fixed upon the ground. An overwhelming force of images, thoughts, impressions crowded on my mind, and nothing tangible distinct but this. My love had been cherished in vain. My hope was gone for ever. I must tear myself away at once, and banish or suppress all thoughts of her, like the remembrance of a wild, mad dream. Gladly would I have lingered in that place for hours, in the hope of catching at least one distant glimpse of her before I went. But it must not be. I must not suffer her to see me. For what could have brought me hither? but the hopes of reviving her attachment with a view were hereafter to obtain her hand. And could I bear that she should think me capable of such a thing, of presuming upon the acquaintance, the love, if you will, accidentally contracted or rather forced upon her against her will, when she was an unknown fugitive, toiling for her own support, apparently without fortune, family or connections, to come upon her now, when she was reinstated in a proper sphere and claim a share of her prosperity, which had it never failed her, 
would most certainly have kept her unknown to me forever. And this too, when we parted sixty months ago, and she had expressly forbidden me to hope for a union in this world, and never sent me a line or a message from that day to this, no. The very idea was intolerable. And even if she should have lingering affection for me still, ought I to disturb her peace by awakening those feelings, or subject her to the struggles of conflicting duty and inclination, to whichsoever side the latter may allow, or the former imperatively call her, whether she should deem it her duty to risk the slight and censure of the world, the sorrow and displeasure of those she loved, for a romantic idea of truth and consistency to me, or to sacrifice her individual wishes to the feelings of her friends, and her own sense of prudence and the fitness of things. No, I would not. I would go at once, and she would never know that I had approached the place of her abode. For though I might disclaim all ideas of ever aspiring to a hand or even soliciting a place in her friendly regard, her peace should not be broken by my presence, nor a heart afflicted by the sight of my fidelity. Adieu then, dear Helen, forever, forever, adieu. So said I, and yet I could not tear myself away. I moved a few paces, and then looked back for one last view of her stately home, that I might have its outward form, at least impressed upon my mind as indelibly as her own image, which, alas, I must not see again. Then I walked a few steps further, and then, lost in melancholy musings, paused again, and leant my back against a rough old tree that grew beside the road. A Chapter 53 Conclusion While standing thus, Absorbed in my gloomy reverie, a gentleman's carriage came round the corner of the road. I did not look at it, and had it rolled quietly by me, I should not have remembered for the fact of its appearance at all. But a tiny voice from within roused me by exclaiming, Mama, there's Mr Markham! I did not hear the reply, but presently the same voice answered, It is indeed, Mama, look for yourself! I did not raise my eyes, but I suppose Mama looked for a clear, melodious voice, whose tone thrilled through my nerves, exclaimed, Oh, Aunt, here's Mr Markham, Arthur's friend. Stop, Richard. There was such evidence of joyous, though suppressed excitement in the utterance of those few words, especially that tremulous, Oh, Aunt, that it threw me almost off my guard. The carriage stopped immediately, and I looked up and met the eyes of a pale, grave, elderly lady surveying me from the open window. She bowed, and so did I and then she withdrew her head, while Arthur screamed to the footman to let him out, but before that functionary could descend from his box, a hand was silently put forth from the carriage window. I knew that hand, though a black glove concealed its delicate whiteness and half its fair proportions, and quickly seizing it, I pressed it into my own, ardently for a moment, but instantly recollecting myself, I dropped it, and it was immediately withdrawn. Were you coming to see us or only passing by? Asked the low voice of its owner, who I felt was attentively surveying my countenance from behind the thick black veil which, with its shadowing panels, entirely concealed her from me. Ah, uh, I came to see the place, faltered I. The place? Repeated she, in a tone which betokened more displeasure or disappointment than surprise. Will you not enter it then? If you wish it. Can you doubt? Yes, yes, he must enter cried Arthur, running around from the other door and seizing my hand in both his. He shook it heartily. Do you remember me, sir? said he. Yes, full well, my little man, altered though you are, replied I, surveying the comparatively tall, slim young gentleman, with his mother's image visibly stamped upon his fair, intelligent features, in spite of the blue beaming eyes with gladness and the bright locks clustered beneath the, his cap. Am I not grown? said he, stretching himself up to his full height. Grown three inches upon my word. I was seven last birthday, was the proud rejoiner. In seven years more, I shall be tall as you nearly. Arthur, tell him to come in. Go on, Richard. There was a touch of sadness as well as coldness in her voice, but I knew not to what to ascribe it. The carriage drove on and entered the gates before us. My little companion led me up the park discoursing merrily all the way. Arriving at the hall door, I paused on the steps and looked around me, waiting to recover my composure, if possible, 
or at any rate to remember my new formed resolutions and the principles on which they were founded. And it was not till Arthur had been for some time gently pulling on my coat and repeating his invitation to enter that I, at length, consented to accompany him into the apartment where the ladies awaited us. Helen eyed me as I entered with a kind of gentle, serious scrutiny and politely asked after Mrs Markham and Rose. I respectfully answered her inquiries. Mrs Maxwell begged me to be seated, observing it was rather cold, but she supposed I had not been travelling far that morning. Uh, Not quite twenty miles. Not on foot. No, madam, by coach. Here's Rachel, sir, said Arthur, the only truly happy one amongst us, directing my attention to that worthy individual who had just entered to take her mistress's things. She vouchsafed me an almost friendly smile of recognition, a favour that demanded at least a civil salutation on my part, which was accordingly given and respectfully returned. She had seen the error of her former estimation of my character. When Ellen was divested of her lugubrious bonnet and veil, and heavy winter cloak, etc., she looked so like herself that I knew not how to bear it. I was particularly glad to see her beautiful black hair, unstilted still, and unconcealed in its glossy luxuriance. "'Mamma has left off her widow's cap in honour of uncle's marriage,' observed Arthur, reading my look with a child's mingling simplicity and quickness of observation. Mamma looked grave, and Mrs Maxwell shook her head. "'And Aunt Maxwell is never going to leave off hers?' persisted the naughty boy. But when he saw that his pertness was seriously displeasing and painful to his aunt, he went and silently put his arm around her neck, kissed her cheek, and withdrew to the recess of one of the great bay windows, where he gently amused himself with his dog, while Mrs Maxwell gravely discussed with me the interesting topics of the weather, the season, and the roads, and considered her presence very useful as a check upon my natural impulses, an antidote to those emotions of tumultuous excitement which would otherwise have carried me away against my reason and my will. But just then, I felt the restraint almost intolerable. I had the greatest difficulty in forcing myself to attend to her remarks, and answering them with ordinary politeness, for I was sensible that Helen was standing within a few feet of me beside the fire. I dared not look at her, but I felt her eyes upon me, and from one hasty furtive glance I thought her cheek was slightly flushed, and that her fingers, as she played with her watch-chain, were agitated with that restless trembling motion which betokened high excitement. Tell me, said she, availing herself of the first pause in the attempted conversation between her aunt and me, and speaking fast and low, with her eyes bent on the gold chain, for I now ventured another glance. Tell me how you all are at Linden Hope, as nothing happened since I left you. I believe not. Nobody dead, nobody married. No. Or are expecting to marry. No old ties dissolved or new ones formed. No old friends forgotten or supplanted. She dropped her voice so low in the last sentence that no one could have caught the concluding word but myself, and at the same time turned her eyes upon me with a drawing smile, most sweetly melancholy, and a look of timid though keen inquiry that made my cheeks tingle with inexpressible emotions. I believe not, I answered. Certainly not, if others are as little changed as I. Her face glowed in sympathy with mine. And you really did not mean to call? I feared to intrude. To intrude? What? But as if suddenly recollecting her aunt's presence, she checked herself, and turning to that lady continued. Why, aunt, this man is my brother's close friend and was my own intimate acquaintance for a few short months at least. He professed a great attachment to my boy, and when he passes the house so many scores of miles from his home, he declines to look in for fear of intruding. Mr Markham is over-modest, observed Mrs Maxwell. Over-ceremonious, rather. Over, well, it is no matter. And turning from me, she seated herself in a chair beside the table, and pulling a book to her by the cover, began to turn over the leaves in an energetic kind of abstraction. If I had known that you would have honoured me by remembering me as an intimate acquaintance, I most likely would have not denied myself the pleasure of calling upon you, but I thought you had forgotten me long ago. You judged of others by yourself, muttered she, without raising her eyes from the book but reddening as she spoke, and hastily turning over a dozen leaves at once. There was a pause, of which Arthur thought he might venture to avail himself to introduce his handsome young setter, and show me how wonderful it was grown and improving, and to ask after the welfare of its father, Sancho. 
Mrs Maxwell then withdrew to take off her things. Helen immediately pushed the book from her, and after silently surveying her son, his friend and his dog for a few moments, she dismissed the former from the room, under the pretense of wishing him to fetch his last new book to show me. The child obeyed with alacrity, but I continued caressing the dog. The silence might have lasted till its master's return, had it depended on me to break it, but in half a minute or less, my hostess impatiently rose, and taking a former station on the rug between me and the chimney corner, earnestly exclaimed, Gilbert, what is the matter with you? Why are you so changed? It's a very indiscreet question, I know. Perhaps a very rude one. Don't answer it if you think so, but I hate mysteries and concealments. I am not changed, Helen. Unfortunately, I am as keen and passionate as ever. It is not I. It is circumstances that are changed. What circumstances? Do tell me. Her cheek was blanched with the very anguish of anxiety. Could it be with a fear that I had rashly pledged my faith to another? I'll tell you at once. I will confess that I came here for the purpose of seeing you, not without some monetary misgivings at my own presumption, and fear that I should be little welcome as expected when I came. But I did not know that this estate was yours, until enlightened on the subject of your inheritance by the conversation of two fellow passengers at the last stage of my journey. And then I saw at once the folly of the hopes I had cherished, and the madness of retaining them a moment longer. And though I alighted at your gate, I determined not to enter within them. I lingered a few minutes to see the place, but I was fully resolved to return to Mansfield without seeing its mistress. And if my aunt and I had not been just returning from our morning drive, I should have seen and heard no more of you. I thought it would be better for both that we should not meet, replied I, as calmly as I could, but not daring to speak above my breath from conscious inability to steady my voice, and not daring to look in her face lest my firmness should forsake me altogether. I thought an interview would only disturb your peace and madden me, but I'm glad now of this opportunity of seeing you once more, and knowing that you have not forgotten me, and of assuring you that I shall never cease to remember you. There was a moment's pause. Mrs Huntington moved away, and stood in the recess of the window. Did she regard this? as an intimation that modesty alone prevented me from asking her hand, and was she considering how to repulse me with the smallest injury to my feelings. Before I could speak to relieve her from such a perplexity, she broke the silence herself, by suddenly turning towards me and observing... You might have had such an opportunity before, as far I mean as regards assuring me of your kindly recollections and yourself of mine, if you had written to me. I would have done so, but I did not know your address, and I did not like to ask your brother because I thought he would object to my writing. But this would not have deterred me for a moment if I could have ventured to believe that you expected to hear from me, or even wasted a thought upon your unhappy friend. But your silence naturally led me to conclude myself forgotten. Did you expect me to write to you, then? No, Helen! Mrs Huntingdon! Certainly not. But if you sent a message through your brother, or even asked him about me now and then... I did ask about you frequently. I was not going to do more. So long as you continue to restrict yourself to a few polite inquiries about my health. Your brother never told me that you had even mentioned my name. Did you ever ask him? No, for I saw he did not wish to be questioned about you, or to afford the slightest encouragement or assistance to my obstinate attachment. And he was perfectly right, added I. But she remained in silence, looking out upon the snowy lawn. And what will relieve her of my presence, thought I. And I immediately I rose, and advanced to take leave, with the most heroic resolution. But pride was at the bottom of it, or it could not have carried me through. Are you going already? Said she, taking the hand I offered, and not immediately letting it go. Why? Should I stay any longer? Wait till Arthur comes, at least. Only too glad to obey, I stood and leant against the opposite side of the window. You told me you were not changed. You are very much so. No! Mrs Huntingdon, I only ought to be. Do you mean to maintain that you have the same regard for me that you had when we last met? I have, but it'd be wrong to talk of it now. It was wrong to talk of it then, Gilbert. It would not now, unless to do so would be to violate the truth. I was too much agitated to speak, but without waiting for an answer, she turned away, her glittering eyes and crimson cheek, and threw open the window and looked out whether to calm her own excited feelings or to relieve her embarrassment 
or only to pluck that beautiful half-blown Christmas rose that grew upon the little shrub without, just peeping out from the snow, that had hitherto, no doubt, defended it from the frost, and was now melting away in the sun. Pluck it, however, she did, and having gently dashed the glittering powder from its leaves, approached it to her lips and said, This rose is not so fragrant as a summer flower, but it has stood through hardships none of them could bear. The cold rain of winter has sufficed to nourish it and its faint sun to warm it. The bleak winds have not blanched it or broken its stem, and the keen frost has not blighted it. Look, Gilbert, it is still fresh and blooming as a flower can be, with the cold snow even now on its petals. Will you have it? I held out my hand. I dare not speak lest my emotion should overmaster me. She laid the rose across my palm, but I scarcely closed my fingers upon it. So deeply was I absorbed in thinking what might be the meaning of her words, and what I ought to do or say upon the occasion, whether to give away my feelings or restrain them still, misconstruing this hesitation into indifference, or reluctance even, to accept her gift. Helen suddenly snatched it from her hand, threw it out into the snow, shut down the window with emphasis, and withdrew to the fire. Helen, what means this? I cried electrified at the startling change in her demeanour. You did not understand my gift. Or what is worse, you despised it. I'm sorry I gave it to you, but since I did make such a mistake, the only remedy I could think of was to take it away. You misunderstood me cruelly, I replied, and in a minute I had opened the window again, leapt out, picked up the flower, brought it in, and presented it to her, imploring her to give it me again, and I would keep it forever for her sake, and prize it more highly than anything in the world I possessed. And will this content you? It shall. There, then, take it. I pressed it earnestly to my lips, and put it in my bosom. Mrs Huntingdon looked on with a half-sarcastic smile. Now are you going? I will if... if I must. You are changed. You are grown either very proud or very indifferent. I am neither, Helen, Mrs Huntingdon. If you could see my heart... You must be one, if not both. And why Mrs Huntingdon? Why not Helen as before? Helen then. Dear Helen, I murmured. I was in agony of mingled love, hope, delight, uncertainty and suspense. The rose I gave you was an emblem of my heart. Would you take it away and leave me here alone? Would you give me your hand too if I asked it? Have I not said enough? She answered with a most enchanting smile. I snatched her hand, would have fervently kissed it, but suddenly checked myself and said, but have you considered the consequences? Hardly, I think, or I should not have offered myself to one so proud to take me, or too indifferent to make his affection outweigh my worldly goods. Stupid blockhead that I was. I trembled to clasp her in my arms, but dared not believe so much joy, and yet restrained myself to say, but if you should repent... It would be your fault. I never shall, unless you bitterly disappoint me. If you've not sufficient confidence in my affection to believe this, let me alone. My darling angel, my own Helen, cried I, now passionately kissing the hand I still retained, and throwing my left arm around her. You never shall repent, if it depends on me alone. But have you thought of your aunt? I trembled for the answer, and clasped her closer to my heart, in the instinctive dread of losing my newfound treasure. My aunt must not know of it yet. She would think it rash, wild step, because she could not imagine how well I know you. But she must know you herself and learn to like you. You must leave us now, after lunch, and come again in spring, and make a longer stay, and cultivate her acquaintance. And I know you will like each other. And then you will be mine, said I, printing a kiss upon her lips, and another, and another, for I was as daring and impetuous now as I had been backwards and constrained before. No, in another year, replied she, gently disengaging herself from my embrace, but still fondly clasping my hand. Another year? Oh, Helen, I could not wait so long. Where is your fidelity? I mean, I could not endure the misery of so long a separation. It would not be a separation. We will write every day. My spirit shall always be with you, and sometimes you shall see me with your bodily eye. I will not be such a hypocrite as to pretend that I desire to wait so long myself. But as my marriage is to please myself alone, I ought to consult my friends about the time of it. Your friends will disapprove. They will not greatly disapprove, dear Gilbert. They cannot when they know you. Or if they could, they would not be true friends. I should not care for their estrangement. Now are you satisfied? She looked up in my face with a smile of ineffable tenderness. 
Can I be otherwise with your love? And you do love me, Helen, said I, not doubting the fact, but wishing to hear it confirmed by her own acknowledgement. If you loved as I do, you would not have so nearly lost me. These scruples of false delicacy and pride would never thus have troubled you. You would have seen that the greatest worldly distinctions and discrepancies of rank, birth and fortune are as dust in the balance compared with the unity of accordant thoughts and feelings and truly loving, sympathising hearts and souls. But this is too much happiness. I have not deserved it, Helen. I dare not believe in such felicity. And the longer I have to wait, the greater will be that my dread that something will intervene to snatch you from me. And think, a thousand things may happen in a year. I shall be in one long fever of restless terror and impatience all the time. And besides, winter is such a dreary season. I thought so too. I would not be married in the winter. In December at least. She added, with a shudder. For in that month had occurred both the ill-starred marriage that had bound her to her former husband and the terrible death that released her. And therefore I said another year, in spring. Next spring? No, no, next autumn perhaps. Summer then? Well, the close of summer. There now, be satisfied. While she was speaking, Arthur re-entered the room. Good boy for keeping out so long. Mama, I couldn't find the book in either of the places you told me to look for it. There was a conscious something in Mama's smile that seemed to say, No, dear, I knew you could not. But Rachel got it for me at last. Look, Mr Markham, a natural history, with all kind of birds and beasts in it, and the reading as nice as the pictures. In a great good humour, I sat down to examine the book, and drew the little fellow between my knees. Had he come a minute before, I should have received him less graciously. But now I affectionately stroked his curling locks, and even kissed his ivory forehead. He was my own Helen's son, and therefore mine, and as such I have ever since regarded him. That pretty child is now a fine young man. He has realised his mother's brightest expectations, and is at present residing in Grasdale Manor with his young wife, the merry little Helen Hattersley of yore. I had not looked through half the book before Mrs Maxwell appeared to invite me into the room for lunch. That lady's cool, distant manner rather chilled me at first, but I did my best to appropriate her, and not entirely without success, I think, even in that short visit. But when I choked cheerfully to her, she gradually became more kind and cordial. When I departed, she made me a gracious adieu, hoping ere long to have the pleasure of seeing me again. But you must not go till you have seen the conservatory, my aunt's winter garden, said Helen, as I advanced to take leave of her, with as much more philosophy and self-command as I could summon to my aid. I gladly availed myself of such respite and followed her into the large and beautiful conservatory, plentifully furnished with flowers, considering the season. But of course, I had little attention to spare for them. It was not, however, for any tender colloquy that my companion had brought me here. My aunt is particularly fond of flowers, and she is very fond of Stanningley too. I brought you here to offer a petition in her behalf. That is, that this may be her home as long as she lives and if it not be our home likewise, that I may often see her and be with her, for I fear she will be sorry to lose me. And though she leads a retired and contemplative life, she is apt to get low-spirited if left too much alone. By all means, dearest Helen, do what you will with your own. I should not dream of wishing your aunt to leave this place under any circumstances, and we will live either here or elsewhere, as you and she may determine, and you shall see her as often as you like. I know she must be pained to part with you and I am willing to make any reparations in my power. I love her for your sake, and her happiness shall be as dear to me as that of my own mother. Thank you, darling. You shall have a kiss for that. Goodbye. There now. There, Gilbert. Let me go. Here's Arthur. Don't astonish his infantile brain with your madness. But it is time to bring my narrative to a close. Anyone but you would say I'd made it far too long already. But for your satisfaction, I will add a few words more because I know you will have a fellow feeling for the old lady, and wish to know the last of her history. I did come again in spring, and agreeably to Helen's injunctions, did my best to cultivate her acquaintance. She received me very kindly, having been doubtlessly already prepared to think highly of my character by her niece's too favourable report. I turned my best side out, of course, and we got along marvellously together. When my ambitious intentions were made known to her, she took it more sensibly than I had ventured to hope. Her only remark on this subject, in my hearing, was... So, Mr Markham, you're going to rob me of my niece, I understand. 
Well, I hope God will prosper your union and make my dear girl happy at last. Could she have been content to remain single? I own I should have been better satisfied. But if she must marry again, I know of no one now living and of a suitable age who I would more willingly resign her to than yourself, or who would be more likely to appreciate her worth and make her truly happy as far as I can tell. Of course I was delighted with the compliment, and hoped to show her that she was not mistaken in her favourable judgment. I have, however, one request to offer. It seems I'm still to look on Stanningley as my home. I wish you to make it yours likewise, for Helen is attached to the place and to me, and as I am to her. There are painful associations connected with Grassdale which she cannot easily overcome, and I shall not molest you with my company or interference here. I'm a very quiet person. I shall keep to my own apartments and attend to my own concerns and only see you now and then. Of course, I most readily consented to this, and we have lived in the greatest harmony with our dear aunt until the day of her death which melancholy event took place a few years after. Melancholy, not to herself, for this came quietly upon her, and she was glad to reach her journey's end, but only to the few loving friends and grateful dependents she left behind. To return, however, to my own affairs, I was married in the summer. On a glorious August morning, it took the whole eight months and all Helen's kindness and goodness to boot to overcome my mother's prejudice against my bride-elect and to reconcile her to the idea of leaving Lyndon Grange and living so far away. Yet she was gratified at her son's good fortune after all, and proudly attributed it to her own superior merits and endowments. I bequeathed the farm to Fergus, with better hopes of its prosperity than I should have had a year ago under similar circumstances, for he had had lately fallen in love with the vicar of Luddensfoot's eldest daughter, a lady whose superiority aroused his latent virtues, and stimulated him to the most surprising exertions, not only to gain her affection and esteem, and to obtain a fortune sufficient to aspire to her hand, but to render himself worthy of her, in his own eyes, as well as those of her parents, and in the end he was successful, as you already know. As for myself, I need not tell you how happy my Helen and I have lived together, and how blessed we still are in each other's society, and in the promising young scions that have growing up about us, we are just now looking forward to the advent of you and Rose, for the time of your annual visit draws nigh, when you must leave your dusty, smoky, noisy, toiling, striving city for a season of invigorating relaxation and social retirement with us. Till then, farewell. Gilbert Markham, Stanningley, June 10th, 1847. The end. The end. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do it together. The, the end. end. <laughs> And there it is. So we had our little lovers mix up at the end because something has to happen so that there's some action, sure. But ultimately, it's a quiet little ending. Gilbert and Helen are happy. They have made a life together. Gilbert obviously was elevated from being a farm owner slash worker, left it to his brother, which for Fergus is no small thing. Fergus suddenly gets to inherit property that he never thought he'd have. So that's kind of cool. That puts him in a better state for marriage and a happy future as well. Especially since he was stomping around, not really having much to do. And, and now he does. I know we talked before at length about Gilbert. <laughs> Gilbert not seeming to be any great shakes compared to Helen, who is full of fire and passion and deeply held beliefs and care and and Gilbert he's fine but I think the thing that made it work for Anne was yes for Helen in some ways Gilbert was kind of settling but in a world where settling goes between these two poles I mean he's not a dunce he's not a jerk he's not a snob anymore he's not He's not a bad guy. He's just a guy. He's not Heathcliff. He's not Rochester. He's also not a paragon of wild romantic virtue. He's just a guy. And that's great because they can still be happy. And really, after all the drama that Helen lived through, just a quiet life with a normal guy where she can just raise her kids and live sounds awesome. The end date that Gilbert 
puts down in his letter to his friend is most likely the end date of the writing of the novel. The scholars seem to think that that is the day that Anne finished The Tenant of Watfell Hall, which is kind of cool. And that's it. That's it. We have seen beginning, middle, and end. We have seen things that I don't think we've seen, except it. we got close. No, we didn't get close. We got, we totally got there in uh, The Woman in White, but The Woman in White comes 10 years, 15 years later, something like that. This was, uh, this was groundbreaking and controversial. And plenty of people said exactly what Millward said. There's no excuse, no excuse for a woman to leave her husband. The law said up until, uh, I think, 1842, that there was no excuse. And certainly if, if a woman was being abused or beaten by her husband, she must have done something to deserve it. Because, of course, a gentleman would never do that without cause. And, um, and while humankind will tell us that human nature is actually much better than we might think, that is not to say that there aren't situations where these things happen. And when we're young, making careful and thoughtful decisions about who we choose to live our life with, it's important and has consequences. And I really wish this book was being taught in school now. As I said, next book is going to be lighter weight. It will be something fun slash funny. It will not be by a Bronte. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> We're running out of them for one thing. Ah, oh, I hope you have a fantastic holiday season. I hope your new year is ever so much better. And and that 2021 begins on a on an upswing. We all are in chronic panic fatigue syndrome. <laughs> and uh and I'm I'm done. I'm I'm ready for it to all be done, as I am sure you are as well. So have a great time. Take care of yourself. Wear a mask. I'll talk to you soon. Have a great one. Bye. If you like what you heard today, please leave a review over at iTunes. Join us on Facebook. Meet up with the knitters on Craftlet's Corner of Ravelry. Stay in the know on Instagram or add your name to our mailing list, which I promise will never spam you. In fact, you probably want to buy a lottery ticket on any day that you get a message from the Craftlet mailing list because that'll be a special day. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>